guy in Telluride once described our generation as the generation that it nearly climbed itself into extinction. Well, how long did it take me to write the book? It, it was probably not that long in terms of the time of sitting down and writing intensely, but it was over a period of um, 15 years. Uh, there were just a few times that I set off uh, to write the book in about 1999 when I realized that nobody else was gonna write about that generation, particularly about Alex. And uh, I was very busy at work, but I worked very hard at it, probably got about a quarter of the way through and then Jean McIntyre, Alex's mum, uh, got cancer. So just at the time I thought I might be finishing it, she said, I don't want to see it published in my lifetime. So there was an, an eight year gap. And then I picked it up again when I uh, was given a place at the, on the writing course, the Mountain Wilderness writing course at Banff. And that was really the, uh, the intense time I needed. I just wrote like mad for four weeks, you know, 12, 14 hours a day and came back with a manuscript with only the last chapter to tidy up. So the answer is a long time, but a few very intense periods uh, where I actually was working on it out. Uh, the inspiration for the title uh, comes from an old Tibetan saying, which is variously quoted as, better to live one day as a tiger than a lifetime as a sheep. Uh, it was also the quote that Alex's mum uh, wanted on the plaque that we initially put up at uh, Annapurna South Base Camp. I had the stone made uh, in 1983, the year after Alex was killed, and it was taken by Jean, his mother, um, Livia's sister, Terry Mooney, and uh, Sarah Richards, all of whom played important parts in the book. And they put it up <coughs> in 1983 at the base camp. I had an uh, email about 10 years later from a distant cousin of Alex saying they'd been to base camp and just found a few shards of the broken slate. So I thought, well, I'll have to, I'll have to replace it. So I had a, a more modern one made in very uh, resistible, uh, resistant polymer. And I went uh, back up to my own base camp the year before the book was published and, uh, and, and replaced the plaque that says, better to live one day as a tiger than a lifetime as a sheep. Uh, I first met Alex, uh, well, we met at Leeds University when he had uh, been inspired to come by the climbing community that was there. Now, by that time, I was, well, I was always going to be seven years older than Alex. I was doing postgraduate work and he'd come to study geography and economics, I think it was. He eventually graduated in law, so he was there quite a long period. And I never quite finished my PhD, actually. So all we did was climb. So I met him there, and he was this uh, just amazing uh, Adonis-like kid who probably was only climbing severe at that time. And he became a bit of a bit of a joke uh, in the club. He was called Dirty Alex because he never seemed to have washed his face or any of his clothing. Uh, but we all liked him, and he climbed an awful lot with John Sire. And Sire took him under his wing. He just spent. Uh, days holding Cybert's rope as they were working out new projects. John always went ground up, he never never inspected stuff from the top. So that could sometimes take me two or three days of sitting in the damp Yorkshire grid. Uh, which, you know, and you know, so slowly but surely, Alex uh, became endeared to us all. And then uh, it just happened that, let's see, in 74, uh, I was stuck with the climbing for a climbing partner and Alex had arrived in the Alps, never having done an alpine route. So we did our, uh, I took him up his first alpine route, which is the stories in the book. Uh, he wasn't a very happy bunny, we had a pretty harrowing time, but uh, that was when I first really got to know him. And after that, uh, we climbed a lot together and the kind of respect group for each other grew. Uh, my plan when I began to write the book was really just a biography about Alex. Uh, but as I tried to write that biography, I realized I had two problems. One is Alex died at the age of 28. So really, he only had a preface of his life. So it was going to be a very thin book indeed if I just told the story of Alex, important as it was. But the other major thing was that Alex was in the middle of a remarkable uh, generation of climbers. And nowadays, the climbing population is much bigger than the population then. 
we, we knew everybody in our generation, uh, certainly in Western Europe. We didn't know them personally and hadn't tied on a rope. Uh, we'd certainly bumped into them somewhere, either on exchanges or they'd come to England, we'd gone to France and the Alps. Uh, and Alex uh, was a, Alex was kind of a progeny of that generation. It was impossible to write the book without putting him into context of both the older generation, the generation of, of Doug Scott and Chris Bonington. Chris in particular was still running large uh, national expeditions for the most part. And John Syrett, Henry Barber, the purest rock climbers that were coming along. And Alex learned from both sides. He knew he wanted to go climb big mountains, but he also wanted to climb like Syrett and climb as cleanly and uh, effectively and lightweight as he possibly could. So in there was the germ of Alex's style. The other thing about Alex was, he was quite a quiet character in his early days. It wasn't until he gained international reputation that he became to be known as a, a bit of a uh, outspoken, as it were, <laughs> describing Messner as somebody with uh, uh, interesting projects until he began to chase the numbers. By that he meant the 8,000 meter peaks. He was a purist. Um, but he was, all, he was quiet and he listened and he learned from those contemporaries around him. Uh, so it was impossible to write the book without bringing in a lot of other interesting characters. Uh, I didn't start out to celebrate everybody, but it was impossible not to. We had uh, great times on all the expeditions we went on, but it had to be the first trip to Afghanistan just because that was it was as partly a tale from a thousand and one Arabian nights, partly a, a Greek epic, partly a tale of uh, resistance of a Cold War country against the Russians, because it was the trip where the Poles uh, smuggled us across the Soviet Union by train to Afghanistan, and there were all the shenanigans of changing money on the black market. Uh, we couldn't possibly afford to fly out, but by changing our dollars and pounds, we had about 5,000 altogether. We were able then to uh, get enough slotty to get return tickets for 14 of us to get out of Afghanistan. And Alex, I remember him, he was our kind of uh, our DJ. We could never get the ghetto blast off and he was just sat on his lap, but he would choose the music and let the world just go crazy around him as Zavada was smashing speakers on the trains because it was playing Russian music and uh, then Wojtek came in and organized a little breakaway uh, trip uh, of just Alex and myself and Jan Wolf from the main expedition to go and climb this thing called Bandaka. And I suppose it was my favorite expedition because Alex, I knew him, I climbed him a lot, but we had the better part of four months together on a journey from England all the way to Afghanistan and back again. Porter and McIntyre becoming Porter Ski and McIntyrevich on the Russian train to disguise our true identity and we were arrested in Termas. It was just magical. And Afghanistan in those days was, it was uh, the world of the Thousand One Nights. Uh, it was full of carriages and uh, women in their full shot eye being taken away to on their truce at night. The bells of the ponies lying on the hotel roof and miles of Sharif, it was magical music, uh, all that's gone I fear. So it was unique and perhaps the most unique thing was uh, it was our first trip and we climbed this really formidable uh, mountain, uh, the northeast face of Koi Bandaka. Alex came back six weeks later and did the Iger Direct in, in three days with Tobin Sorensen, maybe even four days actually. But uh, he said it was, it was a snatch compared to Bandaka. Uh, and it really cemented our friendship that trip. Alex's hair was a mystery to us all. Uh, it was just this huge mop that stuck out everywhere. When we first met him, you could hardly see his face. Uh, I think as his reputation improved and his success with uh, uh, some of the girls improved, he actually began to take a bit more uh, notice of his own appearance. I think particularly when he went to the BMC and everything expanded, uh, he, I've been told by Dennis Gray that he probably had somebody actually cut his hair back a bit so he looked a bit more presentable. I don't know how he kept it looking so good, he probably never washed it, it was probably just all natural in that sense, um, uh, but uh, it was a pretty amazing head of hair. Um, 
he was oftentimes uh, mistaken for Mark Baldwin by a young girls on the street. And strangely enough, it was the same hairstyle that John Syrett did and had in chill books. So the three of them together made uh, quite, quite the three musketeers. As I was writing the book and putting Alex into the context of that generation, the occurred to me not much has been written about a lot of other really important climbers, really interesting characters who were uh, colleagues, friends, com competition for Alex. So I think the next book would be uh, probably not in-depth biographies of everybody, but maybe 30, 40 pages of profiles, you know, to include people like Alan Rouse, um, Roger Baxter Jones, Alison Chadwick, really interesting characters, John Syrett, people that had real impact uh, on that era and the way we climb today, but are now forgotten.